Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am honored and privileged to be speaking with the one and only Catherine Page Harding. Paige is a tenured professor in the Department of Psychology at University of Texas in Austin, where she leads the Developmental Behavior Genetics Lab and co-directs the Texas Twin Project. She has her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Virginia. She is well published in genetic influences and complex human behavior. She's had her research featured in popular media outlets such as the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Huffington Post. 2017, she was honored with the prestigious National Award from the American Psychological Association for her distinguished scientific contributions to the study of genetics and human individual differences. She is the author of the brand new book entitled The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality. And that is what we talk about in this episode. We start the conversation by talking about her background and some of her motivations for writing the book, where it comes out of much of her research that she does in the lab. We start the conversation by kind of laying the groundwork by asking the question, why do we need to study human variation at all? I think this is a super important question. Some people say we shouldn't do this. Some people say we should. Some people overemphasize this. Some people underemphasize this. And so we kind of get the ball rolling by it really thinking about why is this important to study human difference or human variation. We talk about how genes can be understood as luck or a type of lottery, and that's, again, the title of her book. And she explains why she uses that uh, kind of consciousness-raising uh, metaphor. We talk about the difference between genetic variance and genetic shift. We spend some time talking about GWAS, what they are, what they do, and why they're important. She gives some of her explanation of her disagreement with her uh, former advisor, uh, Eric Turkheimer, on GWAS. We talk about the tools used for social science um, and how many of the tools we have, so many of the statistical uh, tools and procedures were created by some, you know, not so good characters in the 20th century, some, some people that were big proponents of eugenics and many other terrible things. And we kind of struggle and wrestle with this question of, you know, we don't have to obviously condone the actions of the individuals, but, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with the bell curve or t-test or factor analysis. And so what do we do with the kind of tools for understanding many things about uh, social science? And we have a sort of a broad conversation about how do we separate the art from the artist, ideas from various thinkers, and, uh, and certain tools created by certain social scientists. So we have a broader conversation about that. We talk about seeing the author's intent for things that they try to write. She talks a little bit about some of her experiences in writing the book and how she uh, tries very, very hard to be very clear about what she is saying and what she's not saying. And we talk a little bit about some of the feedback on that end. Uh, we talk about how the science is the science, and many people will have different camps, you know, hereditarians or people that focus on the environment, and how she basically is trying to look at the science and then figure out the interactions between them. Uh, so she talks about some of her similarities and some of her differences with the different camps. We talk about her executive functioning research that she's been doing, um, which is really, really fascinating research. We talk about that. We also talk about, towards the end, some of the implications of what we can understand about genetics, what we can understand about intelligence and cognitive abilities, and, and just the implication that genes have overall for humans, and what that means about certain things uh, concerning equality, um, certain types of justice for certain folks in society, and how we can have some opportunities and accessibility where we're living in a world where people can understand things about themselves and be able to get the best versions of themselves out there. This was uh, such a wonderful conversation. Um, I followed Paige's work for a long time, and I was really excited about her book uh, to come out this year. Uh, it's a very good book. I highly recommend it. 
And I have to just say, she is a extremely brilliant person, but she's also a wonderful person. Um, she has a very uh, kind soul, uh, really, really, you know, awesome personality. And she has a really big passion for this research and for trying to communicate science accurately and effectively. And that really, I think, comes out in the conversation. And I greatly respect her for that, uh, along with the great work that she's doing. So um, now I bring you Catherine Page Harden. I'm here with Catherine Page Harden. Catherine, or pa Paige, excuse me. <laughs> what, um, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You coming on my podcast. I know you're super busy and you're teaching and doing research and you're on a lot of other people's shows. And so it's a, it's a big honor and privilege to, to have you come on and talk to me about your research and your new book. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's also a privilege to have these conversations with a lot of different people. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's right. So we're going to mostly, I would say, primarily talk about your book that is out as of yesterday, September 22nd, 21st, 21st. 21st yeah. um, the book is The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality. It's a great title, by the way. I like that title. Thank you. Um, yeah. So just tell folks just a little bit about who you are and what you do and where you do it. And, um, and then we'll get into the book. Yeah. Um, so I live in Austin. I'm a professor in the psych department at UT Austin. Um, I've been here essentially since graduate school. My PhD is in clinical psychology. So I had this one weird year after I finished my dissertation where I worked in full-time inpatient psychiatry outside of Austin. And then I got a faculty job and moved uh, here to Texas. In my lab, we, um, we study children and adolescents, both mental health conditions. So uh, more on the like what people call the externalizing spectrum, um, risk for addiction, delinquency conduct disorder. And then we also study academic achievement and cognition. Um, so uh, that is my research, which means I've been, you know, I've spent all of my career in this um, space of studying how do genes combine with social environments to shape children's lives. Um, and that science has been, uh, you know, people use the word revolution and I don't want to use that lightly, but I, I don't, I don't think it's the wrong word. I think the technology, um, for measuring human DNA has been a revolution. Um, at least since I started graduate school, you know, in the last 20 years, since we, um, scientists sequenced the human genome and now, you know, we can measure DNA directly from millions of people. And so the book is really an outgrowth of, you know, wanting to talk about my own science and the science that other people are doing, but also just kind of grappling with what, what does that science mean in a time of heightened social inequality and social justice concerns? Um, also at a time where the science is moving really quickly. So that my book is really kind of a snapshot of, you know, my own thinking about some complicated issues about, you know, human difference. Um, and I'm trying to explain to people about these scientific tools that I, I think are, are evolving so rapidly in really exciting ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I didn't know that you, you worked inpatient for a little bit. Uh, yeah. that's, those are, those are kind of, uh, my uh, areas, I won't say of expertise, but my areas I've worked in the most uh, as well. I worked six or seven years in inpatient hospitals and um, like yourself, I have a doctorate in clinical psych, so we, we have similar training in some ways. Yeah. Um, you're, you're much more brilliant than I am. You're, you're, you're tackling genetics. I had a bit of that in my dissertation and I was like, oh gosh, this is like another language. So it's, uh, it is tough, tough, tough stuff to kind of get into, but you, you do it well. You. I guess the one question before we get to uh, the bulk of the, the book is why do you think it's important um, to study human difference or human variation at all? And many oh, people okay. would say, Ooh, no, let's not do that. Um, or why should we do that? And I'm just as a general question, you know, just to kind of tee us up for, you know, the, the, really the book is why should we look at this stuff? Why should we look at human variation? Yeah, gosh, that's such a good question. I, 
I feel like it would be impossible for me not to be interested in that question personally. <laughs> and, you know, I'm obviously the sort of person who went and got a PhD in clinical psychology, which is about human differences in how we perceive reality and how we feel. And, you know, I, when I teach undergrads, I teach a really large intro psych class um, I don't think I'm alone in finding those questions fascinating. Like, why does why do some people feel vulnerable to anxiety or depression, or um, why do they struggle with addiction and other people don't? Um, you know, as a mother, I talk about this a little bit in the book. You know, I have more than one kid, and so I'm also seeing you know, how do differences in, in people's personalities play out in my own family? Um, I think that's just such a core question that lies at the heart of psychology is, you know, the question of why do people's lives turn out differently? Mm -hmm. um, for, for a lot of scientists, there's this kind of clean distinction between studying kind of more psychiatric disorders versus the sort of variables that maybe economists would study more like labor market outcomes or socioeconomic status um, or physical health whereas for me i'm really interested in how those things are wound up together like how does our social position you know affect our risk for mental disorders how does our behavior affect our physical health how does our physical health affect our success in education and in the job market um so i think as long as there are humans there will be humans who wonder about why humans are different <laughs> from yes. one another yes we're always comparing ourselves as social creatures yes yes i i agree i think many times we have a idea or an inkling of a certain construct and we don't really understand it initially, and then it, we are able to understand many aspects of it um, by understanding, well, where it doesn't happen or where mm -hmm. it happens differently. And so mm -hmm. it's this weird counterintuitive thing where it's like, well, we have some idea that this thing exists or this mm -hmm. uh, behavior exists, but we can't really get at it. And then when we see where it doesn't happen or happens differently, then it's, oh, okay, now we can kind of understand you know, what this thing is, whatever it may be. And it's not always like that. That's a, it's not, that's not the cleanest version of that. But I think sometimes, um, at least in, in psychology and human behavior and perception and et cetera, there's a long history of, of that, of saying, okay, how do we look at, sure, psychopathology, but how do we even look at, um, you know, the distinct subjective experiences that people have, you know, and, and how do we understand, you know, different components of that. And so, so many times, um, you know, I think that the importance of studying human variation or difference is because it helps us understand the things that we're trying to get at initially, which is a kind of a weird roundabout way. And yeah, so, yeah. yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, um, uh, science proceeds often by comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's very difficult to understand normal reading development if you're not also looking at children who struggle with dyslexia right. or some sort of learning difference and it's really hard to understand anxiety unless you're seeing well how do how does fear processing work in people who don't have a phobia um it's always that that um by virtue of comparison that we can see the the, the first thing more clearly yeah yeah i know i absolutely agree okay so most of your book is about genetics um so <laughs> your your main premise is that genetics are a function of luck, which, um, you know, that doesn't really, you know, that that's I don't I don't find that you know controversial or provocative necessarily, um, but you know, kind of like in the book's title, you know, it's it's a type of lottery for us as humans. Like, you know, we don't get to choose our genes, we don't choose our parents, we don't choose where we're born, etc. So maybe just kind of expand on that on, on what your meaning by that and then you know kind of how you use that as the kind of uh pathway for how you talk about many of these complicated issues yeah so i think the 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 lottery metaphor for genetics is seen most clearly when you're thinking about let's imagine a pair of parents and 
when they are reproducing, when we're thinking about all the all the sperm that he could produce, all of the eggs that she her body will make, how many different possible combinations of those sperm and those eggs could there be? With each one of those gametes being a product of, um, you know, the the genes that each parent have being shuffled together and recombined into new combinations and then packaged off, you end up with this incredible combinatorial explosion of possibilities. So um, the biologist Sean Carroll has this book, a series of fortunate events, and um, uh, this, which is where I got this figure from, which was any pair of parents, there's 70 trillion possible genetic combinations that they could pass on to their offspring, which if you come from a large family or you have siblings, you kind of get a little bit of a hint of, right? That like you are not a clone of your brother or sister. Um, if you have multiple kids, you see, oh my gosh, these kids are different from one another. Um, so a big part of why I emphasize the, the lottery metaphor is I think it pushes against some common intuitions about genetics that exist in public conversation, mm. which is that genetics is all about how parents are similar to their kids or you know, what we're inheriting from our parents, sort of between family differences between people. Mm -hmm. And genetics is obviously relevant to that, right? Like if we, if we see that parents and children are similar to one another, like there's always a possibility that gen genes are playing a role in that similarity. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also this incredible amount of genetic diversity that's existing within families. And in that, uh, you know, every generation, there's this, there's this lottery, it's like a powerball of like which genetic combinations are going to be passed on to the next, to the next generation. Um, so I think once you think about it from that perspective, like the fact that you're you and your siblings are them, like you got the genes you got and the, you know, that your siblings got the genes that they got and how, you know, to what extent did that affect your life? Um, you know, how does the outcome of that genetic lottery matter? And then you start to think it, think about that process playing out across generations, right? Like your parents' genes were a product of a lottery too, and they're, you know, your grandparents and their grandparents. Um, I think that pushes on a lot of the stories that are often told about genetics when we have to think about just like the role of multi-generational randomness and chance that goes into the genome of every person. Um, and that's, I mean, I would just say like kind of a, in a broader level, like I'm just really interested in the role of luck in our lives, like not just genetic luck, but just, you know, if we, if we stop to think about like contingency and chance, I think it can be kind of overwhelming and unnerving um, at, at times. Um, but we now have these tools to, to, to see a little bit of how this genetic lottery is playing out within families. And I find that the scientific study of that to be really fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, following the luck thing a little bit broader, like you're saying, not luck, yeah. not just in genetics, but more broadly. Um, I had a lovely conversation earlier this year. It was a while ago now with Greg Caruso, who wrote the book, just dessert with Dan Dennett. Mm -hmm. And he's obviously written many books. And we talked about free will as the thing that comes <laughs> up often, right? So yeah. it's, a, it's a popular conversation, but he, he's, I like his, his approach and his kind of temperament and how he handles this question. And, you know, we talked about the element of, of luck. We, we, mm -hmm. we don't, you know, I don't know the next sentence I'm going to say, I don't know the next movement I'm going to do. Um, mm -hmm. Even if I feel like I'm choosing it volitionally, et cetera. And that doesn't, you know, exonerate people from certain, you know, behaviors or things that they, they they may um, uh, behave or how they may behave. But if you narrow it all the way down, that there is this element of luck in, in many situations. Um, mm -hmm. And we kind of went through some fun, you know, thought experiments and, and, and as such. And so I, it seems obviously genetics are a, a function of luck as well. And, and it's what you're, if I'm, if I'm reading it right, is you're trying to say, okay, we're, we're given a set of variables 
right? With our, with our genes. There's many, many genetic combinations we can have and whichever ones that we have um, are, yeah, it's kind of like a Powerball, right? We're doing a, a, a lottery here and we're, we're choosing it. And then after that is where things become more um, manageable or there's ways in which there is more things in flux, right? It's, it's less, you kind of have the, the, the program set in motion and then we can say, okay, now we look at all the interactions. Now, how do we yeah. look at offsetting many of these ways in which it can potentially play out of sorts? Yeah. And so that's that interaction based on what I think you're, you're saying in the book is, is where the, you know, the, the, those details are where the devil lies, I guess. <laughs> <in some sense. laughs> yeah. You know, there's this, there's this um, visual metaphor that I, that I use a lot when I give talks about this. And it's this drawing from Conrad Waddington um, in the 1950s. Um, and he called it the epigenetic landscape. And what he's talking about in his work is essentially, you know, how does a cell, when every cell in your body has the same genetics, how do cells differentiate? Um, but I think it's a really lovely metaphor for thinking about not cells, but people, like how do people's lives play out, right? And so in, in this sketch he made, you have this, um, you know, you have this hill and there's a ball that's at the top of the hill and it's about to roll down the hill. And the top of the hill is pretty um, wide open. And as you go down the hill, you start to get increasingly steep sort of valleys and troughs in the landscape. And so you see, you know, this process where, you know, there's a lot of possibility at the beginning. And then as the ball picks up speed and goes down the hill and the valleys get steeper, you know, the trajectory of that ball gets increasingly channeled in sort of one direction versus another. And then, you know, jumping the tracks to a different part of the epigenetic landscape is, is increasingly more difficult to do. And I think of that as a really great metaphor because it's capturing this kind of both and like it's both the starting point and it's the complexities of how your family structure and your social structure have set up the valleys and troughs, you know, the hills and valleys of this landscape, you know, so you can both think about in what ways does a formal education system track people versus not track people and how flexible are people's trajectories if they you know miss one turning point in order to get into education mm -hmm. elsewhere but then you can also ask you know how do people's initial positions both genetic and environmental mm -hmm. shape their likelihood of ending up at one of these turning points in their first place and you can't really understand the landscape without considering both things right like both the shape of the landscape what are the valleys that push push a person down this life path versus this life path right. and how could they be different across different societies but also where does the ball begin in the first place right mm -hmm. um so i think that's ex exactly true like there's so much developmental flux mm -hmm. As soon as, you know, you, you get as a fetus, like you are given the hand that you're dealt, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's so much developmental um, plasticity that's happening after that point, which is also really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like the metaphor. I, it, it makes uh, sense. If I visualize it in my mind, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it definitely makes a lot of sense in terms of where we start. And then you have all of these in, interactions with the, with the environment, obviously that mm -hmm. are implicated in that yeah um so so let's we'll talk about like kind of genes and i like your i think it's in chapter three your cookbook analogy which is <laughs> it's, it's a good one it's a good one for you know genes are tough to explain to people so i think it's uh it, it, it's helpful to kind mm -hmm. of spell it all out but before we get to that I, so i may be doing this out of sequence and so maybe we we should start there and then i can ask this but you know you tell me but there's a Many people talk about genetic variance versus, mm -hmm. you know, genetic shift, right? And this mm -hmm. is a little bit uh, specific or maybe a little in the weeds, yeah. but, um, you know, my understanding is one's more implicated for individuals and one is more implicated for populations. Maybe that's yeah. too reductionistic. Um, how do you understand this idea of genetic variance and genetic shift and, and why we want to think about that or understand that? Yeah, gosh. Um, so I would say that I'm, you know, my work is, is fully 
is really firmly in the kind of genetic variance camp. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about what, you know, who am I studying um, or who are researchers that do similar type of work studying, um, you know, I'm looking at among a group of people who are all pretty homogenous with regards to their genetic ancestry, you know, how do differences in them genetically relate to differences in their phenotypes? But generally those, you know, the people that I'm studying, it's not just that they're homogenous with regards to genetic ancestry, they're homogenous with regards to time and place too, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's um, people whose genetic ancestors were all from Northern Europe and who identify themselves as white British and who are living in the UK and, you know, the year 2020 and are in, you know, this group of 500,000 people who are mostly older adults, right? So what I'm looking at is really not about how, like how that group differs and or has shifted from, you know, I'm not getting a genetic selection or drift relative to other population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, What's interesting to me about the conversation is that, um, you know, that's happening in science right now is that population geneticists for whom they are really interested in genetic differences, how they've emerged over time across mm -hmm. populations, to what extent is that drift, to what extent is that a selection, right. are increasingly pay at paying attention to GWAS findings. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the points of intersection between those disciplines are complicated and still being hotly debated, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that I, when it comes to, you know, genetic drift or genetic selection or between pop, you know, between population differences, mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like I, I'm in a state right now of more learning, like learn, trying to learn from my population genetics colleagues, like where their field is going and mm -hmm. how they see GWAS playing into their work mm -hmm. um, versus coming into it with, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we should have really strong priors, I guess is what I'm saying. And that comes through in the book about mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. what are the implications for, you know, we're seeing a snapshot in evolutionary time, mm -hmm. you know, how this plays out in this kind of more dynamic sense is, I think, uh, a, a really kind of wide open question right now. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. I think that, um, yes, I, 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 I know population geneticists, they really, they really like talking about the genetic uh, shift and, and, and how that works. And, you know, that makes sense, right? Because they're looking at whole populations, you know, through time. And so they're, they're having a kind of, um, if you will, uh, you know, wide lens on things. And, yeah. so, and they, they're looking at large groups and, and then looking at how we understand, you know, these different groups. And, um, uh, but I like your answer, though, because I think it's this idea that there is, it isn't necessarily... Um, any kind of hostility or, or that it's, there's animosity between folks that look at variants between individuals um, or that we shouldn't look at groups, but that there is still, I, I like the last point you said about that we should be, I think, have some epistemic humility about what priors <laughs> we have yeah. on both yeah. ends. And yes. that's, you know, that can be somewhat uh, challenging maybe for certain individuals. Yeah. And that's just maybe personality, temperament well, differences. I mean, I think this is, I, I'm, you know, perhaps to my own detriment, <laughs> sort of always attracted to these kind of areas that are that are right at the borders of different disciplines, right? So at the border of psychology and sociology, at the border of behavior genetics and population genetics. Um, because I, I feel like when you're there in those spaces um, is when, one, people end up in the borderlands because they're all focused on important problems, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're problems that are too big and too important for any one discipline. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, there's a population geneticist whom I, whom I quite admire, who on Twitter the other day remarked that, uh, you know, a discipline is a group of academics who agree not to question an assumption. <laughs> and when you start doing interdisciplinary stuff, yeah. you know, this is back to like, uh, was illuminated by comparison is you realize that this is the, these are the assumptions that I have brought into this work that seem totally obvious to me to the point that I've never interrogated them or realized that they were there mm -hmm. until I am talking to people who have entirely different disciplinary training. Right. Um, so that's a space of, of conflict um and tension but ultimately i think productive conflict and tension too so i like paying attention to what the population geneticists are doing but i but i do have a great deal of humility about whether or not um you know i'm keeping up <laughs> with how rapidly yeah. that discipline is evolving yeah yeah it i i firmly agree with what you're saying i think that i like the way you frame it because it's it, when we have people from different disciplines that are you know, maybe they're specialists in a particular area and we're finding what well, this doesn't, this discipline or my research doesn't fully encapture or capture all of the aspects. And I need to, to, to float over into another discipline to get some help in understanding this, but then they have all of their you know, <laughs> uh, 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 conceptualizations and how they do things. Yeah. And it's interesting that, it, so, you know, I've, I um, have had Razib Khan on and I know Razib and, and, you know, he's, obviously population geneticist. And then I've talked to Joe Henrik, who, you know, is one of the best anthropologists at the moment. And, and it's just interesting how, you know, when you're talking to different people with different backgrounds, but they're talking about their, their orbits are colliding, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're yeah. saying, they're talking yeah. about many similar things. And it's, you know, but we, I agree, we need that kind of, uh, um, you know, healthy spurring on of one another to say, well, let me push you a little bit here. And, 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 you know, here's where, you know, and let me, uh, you know, okay. Yeah, we agree here. And so um, I think this kind of question is, is kind of that. And I, I agree. I think we need to be, um, I, I'm, I'm more sanguine about, you know, where that goes. And, and I think that it's only positive, but, you know, I'm sure we'll have <laughs> in the coming, coming years, you know, fun debates about it. So let, let's jump to the cookbook analogy maybe, and you can chart it out for us. Cause I, I want to ask about polygenetic index and scores cause that's yeah. super important, but maybe beforehand we can talk about, um, you know, what are genes, protein, DNA, and how does yeah. all that work? So if you want to give the abbreviated version of your cookbook analogy, that's fine. You don't have to, but kind of yeah. just set us up on how all this works. You know, my cookbook analogy is really designed let me tell you what I'm trying to get across and then I'll go into the actual okay. analogy, which is to try to build in, build an intuition about how coarse and crude a genome-wide association study metric really is, mm -hmm. which I think then should give us a little bit of amazement that it works at all. <laughs> okay. So my, you know, my, a lot of times people, um, like in a, you know, high school biology class will use the analogy that, a, you know, a gene is like a recipe for a protein, right? Like when we talk about a gene codes for something, right? It is, you know, a series of base pairs that's again, that gets, you know, expressed. And what that means is that a certain sequence means that your cell makes this protein. Mm -hmm. Um, but a genome-wide association study or GWAS isn't looking at specific genes. Um, it's measuring genetic variants that are littered throughout your entire genome, like all of your DNA, and doing this really kind of brute force approach of correlating those genetic differences with something that's been measured about a person um, without necessarily knowing if like the measurement is particularly good, right? So like in the case of educational attainment, you know, the measure is, you know, when did you leave school or how many years of education have you completed? That's really, really crude. So, um, you know, kind of running with the, the a, a gene as a recipe, you know, you can think of your genome then as like a giant cookbook, right? Like Julia Child's like art of uh, art of French cooking or whatever, right? At least a collection of recipes. Um, and then we're thinking about comparisons. So um, here is the cookbook that this restaurant uses 
for its meals that it's serving. And here's this other restaurant that's using this other cookbook for the meals that it's serving, right? And so the analogy I use is a GOS is sort of like, you know, going to your town and breaking down the cookbook of, of every restaurant in town into tiny little bits and then correlating it with the restaurant's Yelp rating, right? <laughs> like, which you can, you can come up with like, is our Yelp ratings like the best measurement of what makes a good restaurant in the same way? No, right? But like, but it's easily available for lots of, you know, and I think years of education is exactly the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. does going to school longer make you a more skilled human? No, it's like capturing tons of, you know, there's, it, it's, but is it recorded on almost every medical record? And so you have access to it and tons of people, right? So you have this crude metric of, you know, that, that has the advantage of just being like easily obtained and, and quantifiable. And then you have this, um, this really coarse, um, not at all mechanistically informed characterization of the differences in what food the restaurant is cooking, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, you've, you've, you know, scanned the different restaurants cookbooks. Um, and then you're just doing a big data mining exercise. And the reason why I, you know, I, I use that analogy, which is like very, people are very variable in whether they find that's, that's useful or not, right? Like it's been described as folksy and quaint and illuminating and condescending and, you know, all sorts of things. So I think, you know, your, our reactions to science metaphors can be very idiosyncratic. So if, you know, you're a listener and this isn't working for you, you know, I, tr I tried, I tried to come up with an intuition, you know, to build your intuition. And the, what I want a reader to take away from that is, you know, one, that it's coarse, that it's mechanistically opaque, like you're not really applying your knowledge of cooking to that exercise at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't tell you anything about the environment like at all. Like you're not saying that, you know, the, the better restaurants are better because they have better cookbooks. Um, you know, and that the environment doesn't matter. You, certain questions start to become totally nonsensical. Like, do people enjoy this restaurant more because it uses salt versus like it has good lighting, right? Like those questions don't, like a GWAS isn't answering those questions. It's really, you know, you're, you're characterizing um, the genetic recipes very coarsely and you're characterizing the outcomes very coarsely. And what's amazing, um, amazing to me is that works in the sense that the resulting correlations are useful in that they're correlated with other things we care about and new people, right? So we do a big GWAS of educational attainment. We get these correlations um, and then we apply them to a new group of people and you know we use them to kind of add up information about someone's dna into one number which is kind of an in, like kind of an insane idea to do that and it's as strongly correlated with them going to college as their family income is like i think that we should really stop and be kind of amazed that that is true that like that observation did not have to be true and mm -hmm. it is true and i think that's really interesting Okay, so I have, there. Yeah. I have many questions. I yeah. have many <laughs> questions. Um, I don't really have a, 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 personally, I don't have a, a stake in this race. I'm not like, you know, pro GWAS and it's amazing <laughs> and I'm not like, oh my God, yeah. it's bullshit. You know, I'm, I don't really have a stake in it, but I do, I, it, I think it's important. I think it's interesting. And I think it's, I think it has a lot to tell us. I think there's just a lot of still unknowns in my yeah. mind, but so, so this is in no particular order, but I, I'm yeah. curious okay. about this though. If, if I understand correctly, well, you're saying in the book, you said, you're saying now, and I think you're saying the book, there's like these things that GOS don't do, right? Here's all the things they don't do. Yeah. And if I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, this was the major uh, splitting point between you and Turkheimer, your, your old advisor, where he doesn't really 
he's my understanding is like well what's the point why is a waste of time why are we doing this and you're like no this is really important and you know maybe just tell us because that might i mean you know not obviously have to say anything personal about it but no. just that kind of split of some people will say like yeah who gives a shit and other people will be yeah. like no we should explore this so we could see where this has potential it does seem like that does like many things become a binary but how does yeah. that kind of uh battle kind of work yeah. out and how do you understand that yeah that's that's i think it's a really interesting question i mean i love that you you preface this with like i'm not a gwas hater but i'm not a gwas ad- advocate <laughs> because i actually think that's how we should be around scientific tools right like i don't you know it's like being like are you are you pro or against pliers, right? Like they're tools mm-hmm. and well, what are you using the pliers to do? Could we, is there another tool that's better suited for the thing that you're using pliers for? Or mm-hmm. is this a use case in which pliers are actually really useful and having like souped up handy dandy, super duper pliers is, <laughs> is good. You know, a GWAS with 3 million people is like, a really awesome set of pliers, but like that is not gonna be a tool that's useful for, you know, for all things that you need tools for. Um, I think that Eric and I, by virtue of, um, you know, at this point being old friends and colleagues and liking each other despite disagreeing often, have had a lot of space to identify like what is the nexus of our disagreement. Mm -hmm. And I would be interested, I mean, but it's, I mean, it's like any relationship, any close relationship or even your perspective about what the disagreement is, like can be a own topic of, of disagreement. Of so course. we'll see if he agrees with this characterization. Um, I think that Eric sees the ambiguity around what GWAS is picking up on in terms of mechanism to be more of a hard stop for him in terms of um, being optimistic about the usefulness of of GWAS or polygenic scores in the long run. So I think in his mind, like you're doing these correlations, you can create a polygenic score, you don't know why these genes are associated with going further in school or, or being more likely to have ADHD. And since you don't know why, you shouldn't go around applying them, right? Like if you don't have the mechanism, isn't it dangerous to talk about genetic associations if you don't have the mechanism? Whereas I am on the flip side, which is that I think the the absence of knowledge about why is not this it's not the stop code on it's the starting point right it's the okay well then let's be curious about why and that's going to require us actually using these polygenic scores in new, in new groups of people um underneath that i think is a disagreement which is more general not just me and eric which is about the risk benefit calculus of doing genetic research in relation to socially valued outcomes at all. So I think, you know, I talk about this in the book, for some people, the dangers of, is this gonna feed into some racist classist narrative? Is this gonna be the resurgent of, of, you know, involuntary sterilization in the US looms so large and they don't really anticipate that like the science will get any better um in terms of education or or child development research and i have a different risk benefit calculus around that than i think a lot of people do in that i think doing better science um helps undermine racist and classist narratives i think not talking about genetics doesn't make those ideas go away and i think that um the a social science that doesn't include genetics is more limited than many people believe. So I, that I think underneath our sort of like how important is mechanistic knowledge for doing science with polygenic scores disagreement underneath that is this kind of disagreement about what are the relative dangers and benefits of doing things when we don't know how things work. So 
I'm not saying this because you know you're virtually sitting in front of me. I firmly, <laughs> I firmly, I firmly agree with you. I firmly agree with you because I, if I take the steel man version of of you know Eric's you know p- you know position, sure, there is a lot of that ambiguity is potentially dangerous. Um, it's it's. I think the the part of the issues with with you know Eric's position is I understand that it could be dangerous to to look at some of these things that we don't know we don't we don't know the end of the the road here and what are we going to find I think the problem with that way of thinking or on this argument is in science you don't usually ever know the why it's, it's, <laughs> you don't you don't know that you, yeah. you get at the how. And, and then you can find, um, like with anything, uh, applicable value for it. And that is going to be uh, always a question mark. How people use things is always going to, you can use it for, for, for um, ill will, or you could use it for the best things. And that's just true of anything in, in I think, science. Yeah. Yeah. And about the, the piece of it, and I'm sure we'll get to it later. Um, yeah, I mean, this... You know, research in intelligence, research in genetics has, you know, a pretty uh, dark history with eugenics. But I think absolutely that, okay, we can acknowledge that and we can still, you know, like, you know, Fisher created the T-test and he was a eugenicist. Fine. But T-tests are still super important tools to, <laughs> that we all learn in Stats 101. Like it's, mm-hmm. you can divorce the eugenics I'm not uh, 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 making any consolation for this, but I mean, that was the majority way of thinking at that time, which was repugnant and horrible, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't a minority viewpoint. I mean, everybody from, you know, 1890 to 1945 was a eugenicist of sorts that was in science for many people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're picking up on, like that, that, that question there, which was like, which, which tools can be divorced from their makers right. or their maker's intention? And, and can they be repurposed, you know, yeah. for more, for more liberatory ends is the, is the question that's um, salient for me. I wrote an essay earlier this year and it was called, you know, what do we do with the science of terrible men? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember this article. It's a good article. And, you know, the title is a riff on a question that the, um, uh, Emily Nussbaum, the, um, I don't know if she's, if she's still the TV staff writer, but for, for a while she was the TV staff writer for the New Yorker. And she wrote mm-hmm. a book called, I like to watch and it's all about watching television and i have this weird thing where like i don't actually watch much television but i love reading about television so you know make of that what you will (laughs) um and she has this essay in it and it's about um you know consuming art in the wake of me too right like Mm -hmm. what do you do if you liked woody allen movies what do Mm -hmm. you do if you thought louis ck was funny like Mm -hmm. um and she, what I love about that essay is, is she really grapples with the ambivalence of that without, even if she comes down on one side, never really letting go of the counter argument. So the essay kind of goes back and forth between like, can we stop, you know, separate art from, it, their, from its creator? Um, what does it mean if we do? What are we not consuming if we're, you know, doing this way? Like, what are... And um, it just struck me as so much more of a sophisticated conversation than many of our conversations about that in science, about which of our tools are sort of like, cannot be separated from their creators, which of their tools clearly can be. Like, we're gonna still be using normal distributions, even if (laughs) like Galton (laughs) was the one describing normal distributions because it would be very, very difficult to do anything if we didn't have reference to normal distributions and what are the things in the middle? Um, So I think, I I mean, I said this on another interview recently, I think a lot of people agree about the past where we disagree is about where we go from here. Like given 
what we've inherited historically, given the state of the science today, given what people already think about the science today, what is the best way forward with those circumstances? Yeah, maybe at a at a different point or something. Um, you know, I, that would be such a fun conversation and to have with you about that. Um, it's probably one of my favorite questions: is how do we divorce art from the artist? Um, because I think it's a really complicated, nuanced question. I have many opinions and ideas about it, but it's such a fun uh, conversation to have. Typically, um, I've had that conversation i mostly have that conversation with philosophers and they're just a lot of fun to have that conversation with <laughs> yeah <laughs> because everything's sort of kind of ambiguous anyways and so i had talia wells she's a philosopher out at um in tennessee and and you know she she's a feminist and we talked we had a almost three hour conversation and, and there was probably a good hour of that where we talked about this we talked about al frank mm -hmm. and we talked about what he had when she you know it's just like well, I don't know. And, and let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. And, and we had an, and I, I've good friends with David Hawinski, who's a philosopher teacher in the university of West Virginia. And his whole th area is, I mean, he's super well read is how do we talk about, how can you understand the philosophical ideas of philosophers removed from their own biography? Mm. And it's another yeah. This is literally his whole life's work at this yeah, point is just like struggling with this question. And, and it's, you know, it's interesting. And I know I don't, my one position I do have on that. And so this applies to, yes, many of the statistical measures we use, many of the IQ, much of the IQ research is from a bunch of eugenicists. Yes, we understand that we agree that it's horrible and we agree that we're not continuing on that path. But the question is, well, what do we do? with that what do <laughs> exactly. we do what with we... that knowledge and does it is the thing itself removed enough to say you know well, we can use the devil's tools quote unquote mm -hmm. you know scare quotes you know we, we the, you know there's nothing inherently evil about t-test or factor analysis or the bell curve mm -hmm. just because the person that made it was maybe mm -hmm. a pretty awful person and you yeah. see this in all disciplines. You see this in, in, in design all the time. You see this in, in wow. art all the time. Yes, I mean, yes. these horrible people and they make yeah. the most beautiful art. And it's yeah. like, and yeah. to me, it just says people are terribly complicated. And what I don't understand, but I think is true is a human being can do the most horrible things to another human being and they can do the most compassionate and kind things as well mm -hmm. and that shouldn't happen and it does and we i don't really understand it but it does happen and so then i say okay well i have to sit with that and you know, mm -hmm. the longer i think about it the more comfortable i get with it maybe that, that's not a good thing but you know it's just like okay we can condemn the, the horrible things about a person or we can condemn many aspects but you know how do we still use some of the things that are there, whether it's ideas or art or tools for more uh, adaptive or positive or advantageous purposes that are yeah. very helpful. And, and again, I'm not giving a conclusive answer on it, but I think this stuff uh, in, in social science with its many, much of its history um, is there's a lot of analogous properties to that. So. Yes, I totally agree. I mean, I, I'll just give you a concrete example. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think I mentioned this in my book. I was, you know, IQ tests, which have, which have been used to stigmatize people as inferior or as justification for sterilization. Mm -hmm. They're now being used um, and, and specifically adv advocates for their use by scholars of color that are seeing IQ tests are sensitive to the neurobiological insults of lead, of mm -hmm. other chemical toxins. Can we use this as a tool to quantify in terms that people can understand the adverse effects of environmental racism, right? Like the effects that, you know, children of color are exposed to environments that are toxic 
um, you know, quite deliberately in the way that our neighborhoods have been structured. And I think that's a great example of saying, of, you know, of taking the IQ tests from the people who were using it to evaluate people as inferior mm -hmm. and using them instead to talk about how have environments been structured in ways that are systematically discriminatory against some kids. And that's a very different use case for mm -hmm. IQ tests, um, I think imagining those possibilities is really difficult for people, which is why we need examples of like, like that where we can point to and say, yeah. we're not doing this, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about uh, the polygenetic index and score, and then oh, we, we sort of hinted at it, and then tell me about the, the SNPs, so you can do it in whichever order you want, whichever yeah. makes sense, but these are things, SNPs, and more specifically, I think alleles are probably a little bit more yeah. complicated here, but why so is SNPs that are, important? Yeah, so SNPs are a specific type of genetic variant, and they're just single DNA letter differences between people, right? So, uh, you know, the movie Gattaca is so named because the G, <laughs> G, T, C, and A are the four, you know, abbreviations for DNA letters. Um, and so we can differ where I have a G in a certain spot, but you have a T in that right. same spot. Right. Um, and we also we are inheriting two copies of our genes, one from our mom, one from our dad. So let's say that most people have a G in a certain spot. Um, some people have a T. You could have gotten a GG, a GT or a TT. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can basically just count the number of minor alleles and minor alleles is the version that's less common in the population that you're looking at. So I could have gotten zero minor alleles, one or two. Um, then I've done this GWAS, I've estimated these correlations, and now I'm just weighting the number of minor alleles I have, that zero, one or two, times the correlation with some outcome. So I have two versions of this SNP that are correlated at 0. 0.045 with years of education, right? And I'm doing that for a million SNPs and I'm just adding them all up into one number, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this really crude measure that's aggregating across a ton of information. Um, and that is what's called a polygenic score. Mm -hmm. So polygenic scores are interesting because in some cases, they're as strongly associated with the sort of outcomes that psychologists study as things we're used to measuring, right? So as SES or as, um, you know, in some cases, as personality tests or something like that, mm -hmm. um, they are, your, the effects of your genes can change over your life, but your actual genetic sequence doesn't change, which means that unlike other variables that we use in psychological science, polygenic scores are perfectly stable over your lifespan. Your polygenic score, you know, when you were con conceived, when you started school, when you graduated high school, when you're 80 is the same. Um, so you have this variable that's not subject to this kind of reciprocal causation of being changed by your new environmental experiences. Mm -hmm. And then if you conditional on your parents' genes, your own genetics are randomly assigned, right? So, um, you know, of all the possible combinations of your parents' genes that you could have gotten, which one you actually got is random. Right, right. And so that sort of thing where you've got a variable that's, you know, like everything in psychology is correlated with things like between, you know, 0.1 and 0.3. Like that's what, that's how psychology works, as mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a variable that's in 0.1 to 0.3 land and that is stable over time and that is randomly assigned conditional in your parents' genotype. And that's just a very special sort of variable. Like you can start to do some really interesting science when you think about that kind of variable. Um, is it so, because, yeah. go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go, go, I was going to say, be, is it because so much of what we study in psychology, or if you even broaden it out to social sciences, is that there's so many things that are 
they're um, dynamic, they're moving. Yeah. And because yeah. the polygenetic score is static and it's not changing, you can then say, oh, here's, here's something that's a constant that we can then uh, factor in or out various yeah. variables to then understand many of these things. And so I guess that my, my um, if I play devil's advocate here, many yeah. people uh, or some people will start to, you know, start to get real squeamish, right? You're like, oh my goodness, you're telling me there's something about me that can never change. Not even with the, like, this is like, again, goes back to the whole lottery thing. Like, you know, with genes, it's like forever, no matter what happens, like that's how it's going to be. And what if it's this and it's not this? And then people start to get pretty animated about that. And so, but, but I think what you're describing is, okay, much like with many of the genetic, uh, uh, story is there there it to me in my reading of it you tell me what you think is that there's two there's always two parts the first part is what is right yeah. this this is and yeah. then there's what's implicated and what you do with what is and that yeah. has variability so, so yeah. maybe just say how the polygenetic index uh, works with that yeah no i think that is a lovely way of saying it. I, uh, sometimes you hear geneticists say a very similar thing, which is that behavior genetics tells you about what is, but not what could be. Mm -hmm. And we can think of examples where nothing about people's genes changed, right? They still had the hand that they were dealt, mm -hmm. but the impact of that on their lives changed because of some environmental push or intervention or policy in their lives. Right. Um, so uh, one of my favorite examples uh, in the, the clinical psychology, psychiatry realm is around family therapy. Mm -hmm. So teenagers, some of whom, you know, some teenagers have a higher risk of developing alcohol problems than other teenagers right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that is not surprising to anyone. Right. We can measure part of that with a polygenic score mm -hmm. developed from a genome-wide association study of alcohol use disorders. Um, and so you can look and see, okay, teenagers who have a higher polygenic score, are they more likely to grow up and develop alcoholism, at, you know, as they move into adulthood? And that's true. It's not deterministic, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, it, it's more likely, it's a risk factor. Yeah. Um, if, if those teenagers' families go to family therapy and a particular type of family therapy that helps parents learn how to monitor their teenagers' behavior, who are their friends, this is the importance of having a curfew, the family therapy, it works on average, but it particularly works for kids who are at this high risk for substance use problems, mm -hmm. right? So what you've done is you haven't changed anything about that, like adolescence genes, but if they've been randomly assigned to go to family therapy, their genes no longer predict them developing alcoholism as an mm -hmm. adult, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the like, what is, is you got this, you know, maybe you, your brain is a little bit more sensitive to the rewarding effects of alcohol, right? Like, and that was the hand that you were dealt, but that doesn't mean like, oh, as therapists or as policymakers or as educators or as parents, we say nothing we can do for you, right? right. We think about, okay, well, what do I need to do to, to buffer the risk for, for mm -hmm. these people, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I think um, is really exciting that we are at a point where we can look at, you know, a randomized control trial of a policy or an intervention and then we can see, is it serving people who are most likely to go on to experience these adverse health outcomes? Um, you know, from both a practice and a science perspective, that's, that's exciting. I think we should, <laughs> you know, I feel like part of what I'm, what I'm selling with this book is like, we have these amazing tools, like let's be excited about using them um, yeah. to imagine what could be rather than be, being fatalistic about what is. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I have I have uh, two points to that, I guess. Yeah. Or one question, one 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 uh, point there. 
you know, what it this sounds like is a lot of what, using the example with the family therapy, is I, I, I'm thinking back to my developmental psych kinds of uh, uh, courses and, and all the stuff I was, you know, taught, which was, you know, I'm rem- I, you mentioned it, I don't know if it's in the same part, but you mentioned Broffenbrenner, who was mm-hmm. super huge on, uh, he was a big deal for many um, disciplines. I know social work is, uses him. I know clinical psych uses him. And his whole, you know, it's basically an onion. It's just these kind of rings of sorts. You have the person, then you have the family, mm-hmm. and then outside the family, you have the interactions with the family and the you know, environment or, you know, like the community. And then you have like, you know, society at large and, you know, whatever. There's like five or six. And, and also I think of Vygotsky and the scaffolding, which is really what it seems, um, you know, it's, I'm not making the comparison directly with that, but the idea of, Yes, there are things that are about a person, but it's not as if there's like you you have the program and it just runs itself, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot of yeah. interactions that are happening which cannot it won't change the 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 um it's not going to change the hardware. But it is going to change, you can update operating systems and you can say, well, here's how, you know, policies, you know, environment, family life, SES, all these things are implicated. And I think kind of what you're saying in the book and now is, well, isn't it more prudent to say, how do we understand the things that don't change accurately so then we can have better understanding of how to have appropriate uh, scaffolding for things in society and our environments. Wouldn't that yeah. be much more advantageous for, <laughs> for things and, yeah. and for folks as we, as, we, as we get older? And I don't know, I feel like maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just because you're a good writer or I don't know, but that like comes clear to me, but I feel like many people get like bogged down in the like, you're saying people are deterministic and can't change or <laughs> you're saying this. It's like, I'm yeah, not, there's a whole I, story here. <laughs> yeah, there is. It's really, I mean, it's really interesting to me as an author. And, you know, back to our conversation about separating the art, the art mm-hmm. from the artist, um, the ways in which you can write something that can feel like you're clearly saying X and can be interpreted as Y. And that has definitely come through in some of the responses to the book, mm-hmm. which is really just locating, right? Mm-hmm. It's really strange to read something and someone says, as a kind of a punchline, as a counter argument, like genes aren't deterministic, you know, social structures act on people in ways that privilege some people versus other people. And I'm like, yes, I agree with you. <laughs> and I thought I said that. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, I've been really trying to think about this and be curious about that as a phenomenon, about what is that, that dislocation of, of people responding to, um, responding to a conclusion that I'm not drawing, um, responding as if I'm saying that genes are deterministic or that they naturalize inequality when I'm most emphatically not claiming that genes are deterministic or naturalizing inequality. And I I really think there's just so much associational baggage in this conversation that, um, you know, any text is being read both in terms of the text, but also in terms of the readers, what they're bringing to the text. Um, And there's kind of, you know, as an author, you can try to, to try to anticipate that and slog through it. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm adding to such a volume of, of writing and conversation about this topic that it's going to be, I think it's, I really do think it's impossible to communicate clearly to all people when mm-hmm. this is such an emotionally laden topic for so many people. Yeah. I mean, I think the very easy answer to that is almost, I mean, I do this sometimes. I really try my hardest not to, but um, I think everybody at certain points, some more than others, there are when they before they click on the article or they pick up the book they it's a lot of shedding of priors and assumptions and biases Mm -hmm. and emotional investment one way or the other 
and it's 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 so hard to read it just what the text says and what the author's original intent is and that's very hard for people i think and i mean that's hard for everyone it's hard it's, for yeah, it's hard for everybody i mean I, I i do it sometimes too and you know but i think it's i think that's what it is and it's it's um it, but then when you throw a you know, a topic where, you know, you're touching the nuclear rods or whatever, you know, that's then that's, you know, that's even more, um, uh, investment yeah. of like, Oh my gosh, let me see where this person, you know, has completely fucked this yeah. up or whatever. And that's, that's, there's an agenda of sorts, so, but you know, I just you know, want to, yeah, uh, I just, well, I just, I wonder if you, cause you have worked as a, you know, in therapeutic settings before. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been a therapist for a long time. Um, but I do remember when I, when I was working as a therapist in graduate school and on internship, that mm -hmm. there can be this thing that happens where you've been trying to convey a message to a patient for weeks, for months, right? And then there comes a session where they come into your office and they repeat a version of that thing back to you. Mm -hmm. As if it is an idea that has come unbidden, like from their own brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as if the connection between what they're saying back to you and what you've been saying to them this whole time mm -hmm. is like, and I think there's a really interesting lesson there to be learned about the ways in which people get sort of convinced of ideas, mm -hmm. which is that I think sometimes they get convinced of the ideas even as that they're like invested in like resisting the idea conveyor and it comes through with this i'm going to repeat things back to you that you have said to me as if i'm arguing with mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. and that's really the only analogy that i can come up with from my personal experience to convey yeah. what yeah. it has been like to be read as an author in terms mm -hmm. of some of my reviewers i'll, I'll tell you uh a, a professional and a personal piece of that. So I totally yeah. agree. I think professionally, yes. I mean, I'll see clients for years sometimes and um, that definitely happens. Um, <laughs> and sometimes I'll recognize it. Sometimes they won't. Like, I know you've been saying this and it finally just clicked and it's like, yeah, but it's more of, at least for me, I respect the humanity or try to of each person yeah. to say they have to get it in their way it yes. can't be my way it has to be yeah. their way yeah. and i and you know i'll sometimes you know if i've known the client for a long time i'll you know kind of tease them a little bit and i'll say yeah i've been waiting six months i, I knew this six months ago right and they, <laughs> i know i know and they have to get it their way yeah. but that's a good thing even though it tries our patience because then they own it yes then it's yeah. theirs and, and it's, it's not really it's not uh, uh an import of uh, or surrogate from someone else's. And once they have that, then they can, they can really go further. And so that's on a professional level, on a personal level, this probably happens once a month uh, with my wife where <laughs> she'll tell me something and she'll be like, you know, we should really do this and this and this. And I'll say, yeah, yeah, you know, that's fine. But I don't know. And I'll, I'll have all of my encounters and then I'll come back and, you know, a couple of days later and I'll say, you know, have you thought about, she's like, oh my God, I literally told you this like a week ago. And I'm like, yeah, you did, didn't you? Yeah. Or really? Or, you know, and I just have to get it in my brain. And I remember at one point, you know, we, her and I were, were talking about it and <laughs> I said, you should not take this personally. I do this across the board is my brain just works differently and how I think through things. And I'm almost too um slow in in, the, in meaning that i have to go through all of this i have to drain it all the way out all of the steps and then i get to the answer i i'm just terrible with heuristics where she's like has all of them and then boom she's like there and i'm like yeah i'll get there in two weeks but i i just i have to do every single step first and I, it's a, t a style, a temperament and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, she's obviously terribly patient with me. Um, but it's, it's, it is that it is people. And I think sometimes, you know, those are in, you're talking about relationships, but there, those are in, um, those are the examples I gave are two different types of intimate relationships. One's a professionally intimate relationship. One's a, a personal intimate relationship. But, you know, when you have 
distance with a person. Nobody knows Paige Harding, the author or the scientist. Uh, so they get on Twitter and they'd be like, oh, this fucking blah, 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 you know, and she's just, <laughs> oh my God, you know, she da, 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 because they have a distance. They don't have to do all of that. They're, yeah. they're not, they're not yeah. having the interaction. And the, the hard thing in my mind is how do we, how do we find, um, uh, a, a, a bypass for that to, for to to say with people well let's try and give them be, the benefit of the doubt let's try and understand their intent here and that's you know you get on twitter every day and they're just like that's mission impossible that's never going to happen and my slight optimism is you just have to we have to try that you know one conversation one relationship at a time yeah. and, and hope for that but I, I i fully agree with what you're saying yeah yeah i mean i'm so glad that you brought up like the the, the two examples of being on the other side because i feel like you know it's when you talk about your experiences as a therapist as, or as an author it can be so othering of like oh well this is what other people do right like you know mm -hmm. patients or, or clients like don't realize that these insights are related to what we've been talking about or like people misread me, but I don't intend it that way at all. Like, I think it's, you know, we're, I happen to be right now in this point of my life on like that side of the equation in which I'm the author instead of the reader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would add to what you're, you know, if we, if we have um, um, optimism about, you know, we have to continue be having these conversations and thinking of them in relationship with one another in community with one another. You know, I've been really thinking about this, like, how can I be a better reader of other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like, as, as I read people that I'm coming into that mm -hmm. text with skepticism, like, this is someone that's not on my team or on my side. Right. Right. You know, what do I need to do to change my own approach to reading, given mm -hmm. that I know what it's like to be misread in mm -hmm. that way? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's which is definitely a process. Yeah, it's, it's a hard work. Yeah, it's it's a process, and you're it's. But I think it's a, a kind of a, a maturing and a growth, uh, you know, for yourself. And I think other folks that do that because it's you're pushing yourself. You're trying. It's a you're taking the perspective of the person that is the hardest to take the perspective of someone that's mm -hmm. not on your side, not on your team, someone that maybe you wouldn't, you know, normally bump into, and say, well, it's still a person if they're good faith, you know, uh, actors here, let me just try and hear it. Even if I think I'm going to disagree and I might be surprised, you know, I still might disagree on 80% of it, but there was things I would totally have missed that were, uh, if I didn't do this and they actually are helpful and important to further building some of your conceptualization of things. And I, you know, I think, you know, that's, that's super important to do. Um, <laughs> which, which leads me to my second point. <laughs> um, which is, we talked about polygenetic scores and indexes and all that stuff, indices, and this becomes, you know, that's fine if you're talking about height or eye color or whatever. Mm -hmm. It becomes really, really uh, contentious when you talk about IQ mm -hmm. and IQ between groups. So um, I do not want to spend too much time on this, um, but not because I don't want to have the conversation or avoid it, but it's a lot of... There's a lot of spilled ink on this already. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm going to say this and, and don't, you know, don't take offense. Um, <laughs> I, a lot of what you're saying is not that different from Dick Hirschstein, Charles Murray. There's a lot of overlap between you guys. And I'm not making a comparison there. But I'm, I think that there is something to say. So my reading of it is this. Uh, Murray and, and, and many hereditarians, they like to point to the data and the science, and for to a certain extent, they are correct in many, many aspects, not all. And then it's that fork in the road where it's, okay, so we, we, we know somewhat of the how, now where do we go with it and what do we do with it, right? And that's the very sharp turns that mm -hmm. you're making and that they make. Mm -hmm. um, and Am I giving a wrong um, impression here, or is this a wrong uh, conceptualization? Or, I, or you know, I, how, how do you see I, it? I don't think, it, yeah, I don't think they're too far off the mark there. I, I think, and this, this came up in the New Yorker article too, which is that um, 
you know, when I was, when I was trying to describe to the writer of that article, like, how is this, how do I see what I do as different from the bell curve or, <laughs> or even going back, you know, uh, many more people have read the bell curve than Hernstein's earlier book, which mm -hmm. was IQ and the meritocracy, which was in the late 1970s. Um, which is in some ways an almost a more interesting book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, many of the responses to the bell curve have done what I think is a, is a mistake, which is to say that if it's in that book, it must be wrong. It's all wrong, right? It's mind, it's mind comp for some people. It's just, it's, it's all wrong. It's all bad. And what's dangerous about that is it, it, the temptation to do that, to say that if, you know, if there is a claim that happens to be in that book, it must mm -hmm. be incorrect, right. is it paints you into a corner really quickly mm -hmm. where you're trying to defend really indefensible statements, right? So, you know, I, what you hear, and I hear this all the time, even amongst fellow psychologists who have been through assessment class in their first year of their clinical psych PhD, like they know that this is incorrect, but you'll hear statements like, you know, IQ tests only measure how good you are at taking IQ tests. And it will take you three seconds on Google Scholar <laughs> to know that that's not true, right? <laughs> right? Like it will take you almost no time at all. And then, then I think you're kind of sunk, right? Because you mm -hmm. sacrifice your legitimacy around very easily disprovable provable claims. So why should anyone listen to you when you talk about the stuff that is actually scientifically or morally mm -hmm. contentious? Um, mm -hmm. So this process of if, if someone has braided together something that you think is truth and with error, going back and pulling out these threads are the ones that are true. And these are the ones that I think are an error is so much more work <laughs> intellectually and rhetorically than just saying, you know, IQ tests don't measure anything. They've been debunked. Um, but I think it's really important. So I see the divergence in terms of, um, uh, you know, some people use the word hereditarian to just mean like, do you think the study of heredity is, important for studying human difference in which case yes like i think heredity is important for studying human difference do i think that hereditary influences are inexorable there's no way to 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 change them with social policy or social structure no mm -hmm. do i think most hereditary differences that are relevant for humans fall along racial lines no and do I think heredity is the only or the most important factor in studying human difference? No. So those are the differences that I see. Um, but I am, I'm very careful to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and then okay. just say, like, genetics doesn't matter. Like, an IQ doesn't matter, right? Because those are not true. <laughs> those are not true statements. They're not intellectually defensible statements. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the things that you both that you say in the book, so you know, that yeah. that you guys have an agreement on is IQ tests measure IQ. Uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, that's silly yeah. to say otherwise. Um, and they tell us things in vocational educational systems, you know, twin studies are mean that you know, tell us meaningful differences between people. Um, and that IQ is, you know, has a little bit of being uh, heritable. Those things, you know, you guys agree on, and those are things that some people get upset about. Um, there's another part, I think it's early on in the book, where you say, and you, we've sort of alluded to this, is that if good faith and really good scientists don't do this work, mm -hmm. that leaves a, a black hole open for bad faith actors to use it. And I, I think you have a, a graph in the book of mm -hmm. one of the, the highest, um, or you know, a group that does really like <laughs> genetics mm -hmm. research is legitimate you know, neo-Nazis and white supremacist groups and mm -hmm. really hateful, like actual hate groups. They love this stuff and that's dangerous. And if mm -hmm. you're if you're allow, if you're saying, well, this stuff doesn't exist and it does, and it doesn't matter and it does, and you're just allowing bad faith actors do the research and then allow other people to do it, that's a huge danger. Yeah. And we have to have people that, like yourself and, and, and others, to say, 
look, it's complicated. It's really complicated. Um, and how do we know what is true? And how do we know what we can change and what we can't? And in my view, there's a lot of things that we can make adjustments on. There's a lot of things that we can uh, uh, augment in some ways. No, you can't change your genes necessarily, but you can, you know, the impact and the influence and how it sets out. Uh, absolutely, absolutely we can. And so that, that's the real utility there. And, you know, I, I think in that way when it comes to, so genes impact various traits and behaviors and intelligence mm -hmm. is one of them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that for many folks in, in, you know, in just lack of better term, you know, the hereditarian camp, do you think that there's certain people on the, you know, the hereditarian camp do they, I mean, do they get the data right? And it's just the application of it that's wrong or is it just too, I mean, I have my thoughts on it, but I, is it just too, you know, kind of parochial and it's like, okay, like you're giving me data, but not saying anything about it. Or you're uh, just saying that this is the most important thing. And it maybe there are other things that are important or my favorite one, which is, <laughs> yeah, sure. Environment's implicated, but they don't talk about it. They give like a two sentence line somewhere in there. And then they don't talk about how social structures or the environment are implicated. And it's like, okay, you're acknowledging that it is, but you're spending 95% of this talking about you know, the genetic implications of intelligence and how that's readable and why that's really important. It's like, yeah, but then what about all the other things? If we agree, like most people do, that, okay, 30 to 60% of intelligence is, you know, heritable, then that means uh, 40 to 70% is implicated by the environment. So why are we not talking about that too? You're giving me an incomplete story. And that's, that's where I'm always kind of like, fine. I mean, I can follow this all the way. I'm not going to deny it, but then you're giving me half the data. Why, why aren't we looking at the other side of the data? So how do you just kind of see the reading of it? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's kind of impossible to answer that question because I think the phrase like right and left, I mean, even so, so much of the write up around the book has used the phrase like, you know, right wing or left wing or progressives versus the right. Mm -hmm. and who are we talking about there? I mean, I think this is happening at the same time where we've seen this kind of like fracturing of political identity in yeah. America. And like, what is the right wing right now? Like what is conservative in America? Um, are we talking about evangelicals? Are we talking about evangelical Trump voters? Are we talking about libertarians? Are we talking about, um, you know, posters on Stormfront? Like what, like, I think that, and at the same time with the left, we're also seeing kind of a fracturing, you know, one thing that came up around the phrase, like, do I, am I part of a quote unquote hereditarian left is I'm like, is the left socialists like are the left, like the, you know, the, the middle of the democratic party in America, like is the left classical liberals, you know, so I think part of the reason I'm kind of pushing back against like, I don't even know how to answer that question is that I think the broad brushstrokes in which we talk about responses to genetics are alighting a lot of kind of granularity and fragmentation in mm. kind of the right wing of America or the left wing of America. The other thing that I'm just thinking about is, and I've been increasingly curious, is that kind of Ideological splits around the role of genetics seem apparent to me because I'm an academic mm -hmm. in the social sciences. And so I spend most of my time with other academics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you look at kind of surveys of Americans, you don't really see a huge ideological split in the extent to which they say genetics is important for intelligence or something. And I am so, you know, I don't, I don't think I paid near enough attention to that in my book, but like to what extent that kind of academic conversation in terms of like how we as a knowledge producers in this space are ideologically polarized doesn't necessarily match like how the average American sees it in terms of, you know, how it fits in with their political ideology. Um, like I've been really struck just from doing book related interviews, how, 
how interviewers with a PhD are really likely to ask me about like, how will the right wing use this? How will the left wing use this? And interviewers that are coming up from a perspective of like, I'm a podcaster and I do a podcast on things are more likely to be like, well, of course genetics matters. So anyways, explain to me, you know, <laughs> like the starting points are really different. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, th that was a known response. I'm just like, I think it's okay. impossible to answer that question. No, that's a, that's a fair response. You're, you're, you're sparking something for me that I didn't realize I had passionate opinions on, but I, <laughs> I, I do have a passionate opinion on this is it makes me absolutely upset is so I'm not a researcher, right? I, I don't do that formally. I mean, I have done research, but I don't do it formally. I don't spend my time doing that. But my, you know, I still read the literature. I still talk to folks. I have friends that do it. But it's what I see that happens is a lot of the stuff from academia leaks out into the general population with people that don't, aren't in that world. And they're thrown a bunch of stuff. And then you, you put into that soup identity politics, polarization, outrage, you know, social media with, you know, clickbait. And it creates this absolutely tsunami of bullshit. And to me, <laughs> yes. to me, to me, yeah. to me, the responsibility is on academics to say, not that we have secrets we keep in a lab, but that it's, we need to be extremely careful in how we let this out because we can does not mean we should because mm -hmm. of how people don't have the language or the knowledge base or the training to understand really complicated stuff and they're going to take one aspect of it and run with it and use it for nefarious purposes or they're just going to be very confused you're going to get all these emotional kinds of things invested in it and that's a big problem. Like that's a really big problem to me where it's like, it is on the responsibility of the investigator, the researcher, you know, the, the, the person doing the, the research to say, how do I communicate science effectively? Yeah. And how do I do that in a way that sure, okay, people are gonna take things out of context. Sure, people are gonna do these things, but how do we do that responsibly? And I just think, that's not the whole answer, but I think that's part of it in some ways. And so, you know, I think, you know, yourself and, and, and many other really good researchers that write popular science books or for a general audience that do it well and do it carefully. Um, those are the people we have to prop up. I think of, I've used her as an example before, but I think of um, Lisa Feldman Barrett. She's very good at this. She's extremely good at this. Right. I mean, she's been doing it a while, but she she her, she wrote two kind of popular books and especially the most recent one that was brilliant. I mean, that was fantastic. And, you know, I don't agree with her on everything, but it's the way she explained the science was very good. And we need folks like that. We need folks to, to do this well. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's you're right. It's people, general Americans or just general people. Um, that are looking at this, they're like, yeah, sure. Yeah, of course that makes sense. They're okay. They're not going to be mired in these things. And so I think when you get all this other stuff that's put in there, it just creates this really ugly storm of things. Yeah. I just want a second, like I, you know, science communication is so hard. It's really difficult to do. I started grad school when I, when I was 21. So mm -hmm. my entire adult life has spent, has been spent around people who share a certain set of assumptions and background knowledge and a theory of mind that is necessary to do science communication in terms of where are the errors where are the where's what's the intellectual baggage and myths that i need to address where's the holes in background knowledge that i need to fill in what are the debates that are really salient to me but actually only interesting to like six people in the world mm -hmm. and not really necessary for the general reader to know um, that's so hard to do. And at the same time, I think, you know, there's a reason why scientists talk in jargon and it's because it allows us to tap into a set of assumptions and mm -hmm. convey things with a level of precision to our fellow scientists. There's risks 
to doing doing science communication because even as you're trying to communicate with the general public your colleagues are still over here watching what you're saying yeah. um and so you know if if i could say anything to my fellow scientists having now been on this side of trying to do more popular science communication it is you know be gracious with your colleagues who are trying to do this yeah. when you do a lot of talking this type of thing, doing podcasts or doing radio interviews or doing television interviews, you are trying to communicate in an accessible way to the person you're talking to. And it's so dispiriting when someone comes along behind you and kind of picks out like the one thing you could have said better. Yeah. Um, you know, that doesn't mean you shouldn't always be trying to balance accessibility and precision and going for both. Sure. Um, but it that feeling of... Um, I'm really trying to be clear here, yeah. but it's hard to do that if the incentives within the scientific community are aligned around telling scientists to kind of like retreat back into the ivory tower, right? Where it's safer and you, you, won't, you won't risk messing up in some way. Mm, yeah, no, I really, I agree. And doing this enough uh, with people that are doing this, it, it definitely, uh... I, I hear variants of that and I'm like, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I, it makes me really, really appreciate it. It's hard. It's just super. I couldn't do it. It's super hard to do. So I want to ask Whatever, you are doing it. This is science communication. 100 <laughs> yeah. Doing it. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I do it well. Hopefully I do. Um, we'll, we'll see. But you know, I think it's easier to, to talk than it is to write. I like writing, but I, I don't, it's just so laborious. I'm oh, it's like <laughs> I like, editing and know, editing. I, writing is like running. I don't like writing and I don't like running. I like having written. Yep. And I like yep. having run. <laughs> oh, uh, that's, that's a great way of saying it. Okay, so two more things. Okay. Um, I want to talk about your work on executive functioning because I think it's super, super awesome, super fascinating. And then we can uh, end with some of the more, um, you know, discussion about you know, how we use the, the, this genetic data. So tell me about the, your studies you've been doing. You make a claim that was interesting. You kind of bounced off the page when I read it was you know, that you can understand that executive functioning is 100% heritable in children, which is a strong, anything 100% is you know, pretty yeah. much not existing yeah. in the world. But so that's a strong claim. Um, so yeah, just tell us about the study and how you came to that conclusion and all that stuff. Yeah. So executive functioning is a word that's used in a lot of different ways by psychology. Um, we define it the way maybe a cognitive scientist would, which is as basic cognitive processes involved in the regulation of attention. So we can think of three kind of types of executive functioning. One is working memory. So can you just keep something in working memory short-term store? Um, so like a digit span task where I ask you to remember numbers and you repeat them back to me. You don't have to encode it and recall it, you know, in 15 minutes or in five years. You just need to be able to kind of spit it back out. One is around switching. So can you like if you learn how to do a task under one set of rules and now there's a new set of rules, can you switch and can you switch back? Mm -hmm. um, one is about inhibition. So can you kind of like a Stroop test, can you stop mm -hmm. yourself from doing a prepotent response? And then one is around updating. So related to working memory, if you have you know, one piece of information in your mind, can you kind of monitor for when it needs to be replaced with a new set of information? So what's interesting about these tasks is that they're, you know, they're, as, as you can probably tell, they're really basic tasks. Like adults might have, if they've ever done kind of like a brain training game, they've mm -hmm. done some executive functioning tasks. They're not the direct target of instruction by schools. Um, they're not like IQ tests in the sense that like an IQ test is going to get it more, especially like a crystallized IQ test is going to get it more like, um, situationally dependent learning from experience, right? Like an IQ test will ask about vocabulary, right? Whereas an executive function task is like, press a arrow key on your computer. You know, it's not really requiring like a cultural store of knowledge in the same way. Can I, can um, I just jump in yeah. here? Sorry to ask a yeah. question about the, how you're defining it. So my definition is sequencing, organizing, and planning. Yeah. And that it's mostly prefrontal. And yes. you're talking about areas that are prefrontal and other parts of the brain so how you know if you think about working memory that's usually more uh, it's yeah. moving from uh, cortical to subcortical because it has to store in the uh, yeah. hippocampus and then store to to long-term memory if it's in the temporal lobes mm -hmm. um 
or excuse me, the parietal. Lobe. So if you're, if you're, how do you get to where you're implicating working memory and sustained attention within executive functioning uh, in terms of how you're, how you're defining it? Because yeah. you can tease those out as separate. You can't. So they're both, yeah. So they're both, you know, the, there's a great paper called like the unity and diversity of executive functioning, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. which I think is a great phrase. So these are, these are separable domains. They're not perfectly correlated with one another. Um, they do involve um, uh, somewhat distinct areas of the brain. We have one neuroimaging arm of the Texas Twin Project where we've had twins do these tests outside of the scanner, but also in the scanner. So we can see um, what are some of the networks, the neural networks sort of implicated in doing executive functions. And in particular, which neural networks are activated by, by all of them. So they're consistently implicated mm. regardless of the executive functioning mm. domain. Mm. Um, so we have a paper in neuroimage on that, which is, I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what you see is that they are, you know, like the positive manifold, like all cognitive tasks, they are positively correlated with one another, sure. you know, in the moderate range, like we're talking about like a 0.5 to 0.7. Mm -hmm. And so you can do like a general factor of executive function. And that's the thing that's nearly perfectly heritable in children. So we're, you know, mm. we usually give a battery of 12 tasks that are tapping four different domains. Um, you know, we're looking at variation that's common across all of them. So your general tendency to perform better across all 12 tasks that is our general factor of executive function. And that is the thing where identical twins are, are essentially nearly perfectly correlated for that general factor of performance. Because you've taken, you know, you've accounted for measurement error, right? Like all the measurement error is going to be in the individual task performance, right? So you're looking at the stuff that's consistent and this disattenuation with measurement error um, you know, ends up with like a highly reliable measure of individual difference. And, you know, it is a remarkable finding. We, we don't see that. We also administer just standard IQ tests or tests of academic achievement, like reading um, math calculations. And you do not see that super high heritability for IQ or academic achievement. You see it really for executive functioning, um, which I find interesting in terms of, you know, if you're thinking about like genes to, doing well in school, right? Like there's an infinite number of steps in that causal chain, but I, executive functioning, this, are you, um, are you regulating your attention and memory, like basic memory? Um, it seems to be a really important part of that process. Well, uh, my impulse here is to ask about, um, in understanding the parts of the brain that are implicated in executive functioning, which you've outlined. The, how do I say this uh, clearly? <laughs> it would seem that those parts are less implicated by uh, culture variation. So there's a lot of reaction to things. Uh -huh. So when you think about inhibitions, so like you yeah. mentioned the Stroop test, right? You know, it's just, yeah. you read a series of words and you know, it, you, it's written, the word red is written in blue and you have to either say the color or you have to say the what's written or whatever. Yeah. And so there's an inhibition task and all that stuff. And, or if you do stuff like on the CPT where you have letters on the screen mm -hmm. or whatever, you have to yeah. just not hit the X or whatever it is. Um, it almost seems mechanical and less, mm, like there's less parts involved. So I'm wondering if there's like, in terms of doing the twin studies where it's like, you just have the same parts. And if you have the same parts, you're going to have pretty much the same outcome. <laughs> but there's less, there's yeah. less of the, an interference of, you know, if you do something like information or vocabulary or, um, you know, even nonverbal tasks, right. You know, yeah. uh, for th various things on perceptual reasoning or visual spatial, but it seems as if there's, it is a kind of, um, maybe more unitary than we thought, or there has a one dimensionality to it than we thought. Yeah. I, I, what are your I mean, thoughts on this? I think that's such an interesting question. And I don't think we know the answer, mm -hmm. right? What we're doing now is, you know, we've had this, this massive natural experiment in disruption to children's schooling. 
Mm -hmm. right? Like all of, all of the, our participants are recruited from local schools. So they are all up until recently have been receiving this massive intervention, which is being forced to be in school eight hours a day, five days a week, which is like, is, you know, if you think about the weirdness of that, as like a cognitive intervention for children's development. Mm. And then we had, I mean, I like attempted to homeschool my children for six months and then hired a pod teacher and then they were back in school but still on zoom and then they were you know home for the summer and like what the heck even happened with their schooling and we are a family that has resources that can bring to bear to this problem so what we're looking at now is we started to bring people back in and give them these executive function tasks again mm -hmm. and i'm really interested to see you know the the hypothesis you just put out there is like you kind of have this neural architecture and if you've got this neural architecture there's some sort of like you know um developmental process that's playing out and it, you know and you have it and you can regulate your attention in this way um how plastic is that mm -hmm. to this huge disruption to formal mm -hmm. schooling mm -hmm. i don't have an answer for that mm -hmm. question and you know i don't think we have any data in existence around like longitudinal trajectories of executive functioning in children across this period of you know home disruption financial disruption school disruption so you know you can have me back on this is my one of my phd students dissertations and i'll let you you know in a year we'll let you know um how sensitive is this to um a, a new environmental input that's mm -hmm. just not being in school. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that will give us some information about kind of the, the range of plasticity around executive functioning. But, no, listen, you're always welcome to come on anytime you want, but yes, that <laughs> sounds super fascinating. I, I definitely would like to, to follow on that. Okay, so real quick, uh, you've been more than generous with your time. So uh, I wanna just talk about uh, briefly just kind of the social justice piece. So, you know, yeah. again, you know, the book is called Why DNA Matters for Social Equality. So, you know, you, you are, you, you, you very, I think, uh, very nicely put out in the front, say, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I think social democrat is the word you use. Uh, you know, I'm on the left, you know, that's my political affiliations, et cetera, which I think is good. And I think people should be transparent in their um, beliefs, you know, politically or otherwise. So I guess I just one question I'm interested in, uh, you talk about a little bit in the book is, you know, this we don't have to get bogged down in the debate of it, but how do you understand and then mean, you know, equality versus equity and, sure. you know, how do you see those different? And then what is the role that genetic and, and heritable traits play in those yeah. uh, concepts? Yeah. I mean, I, one thing that was really challenging about writing the book, but also really valuable is that, it, you know, it really forced me in terms of reading a lot of different people who have thought about the problem of equality to, to kind of reckon with like, a quality of what like a quality of what is the thing that's most important to me personally um and i cite the philosopher john rawls throughout the book but i also cite elizabeth anderson who's written a lot about you know democratic equality which is not let's make sure that everyone has exactly the same amount of money at the end mm -hmm. but it's not purely like we just need to you know everything in life is a race and we just need to to equalize people's starting points either. It's how do we build a society in which people participate as equals in relationships of equal dignity, of opportunities for self-actualization in terms of feeling like they have ingredients of a, you know, what Case and Deaton refer to often as like ingredients of a good life, right? And um, you know, one example I use in the book is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is, you know, it, it requires that people have equal access to an enjoyment of places of public accommodation. And I, I think that's such an interesting metaphor for thinking about equality, right? It's not saying, well, there's stairs and everyone can use them and we're gonna be completely blind to the fact that like some people can't use them uh, because of, by virtue of their physical handicap. It's, and they're not saying we're trying to make everyone exactly equal in their functioning. It's they're saying, I want everyone to be able to participate as equals. And what they want to, like, they can inhabit this space with equal dignity. And that, 
that part to me feels really important. And in the US, we can think of really concrete examples. You know, I think people's access to healthcare, for instance, is something that um, I think people should have access to that regardless of their ability to compete in, in meritocratic rat races of higher education, right? Um, so that for like, that's my personal you know, kind of political commitment in terms of equality. Um, how that plays out in terms of how I think about the research is that, you know, most of the research is focused on, and the ba debates about the research are kind of focused on like, you know, how do genes influence your psychological functionings, your IQ, your personality, and to what extent can, can, you know, are those deterministic? No. Can the environment intervene? Yes. I think that debate is almost less important than what does society do with people's genetically influenced functionings, right? Like, you know, okay, the example I always use is, um, you know, some people run faster than other people. We can always train people to run faster. Answering those questions doesn't tell us what the stakes of the race should be. Like, what do the winners get? What do we owe the losers of a race? Mm -hmm. And those are the questions that I think get elided in much, much of our conversations about behavioral genetics. Um, so in the, you know, my goal in the book is part, you know, partly it's, you know, for my own satisfaction, like me describing how do I think of these things going together, but also um, I think when we when we think about our own families and we think about what are the what are the differences in luck both genetic and environmental that my children might experience what type of social structures do i want for them given those differences in luck hmm. and encouraging people to think about social structures kind of writ broadly in that framework of if I really had equal regard for people the way I have equal regard for my children and I recognize genetic difference between them the way I recognize genetic difference between my children, what follows from our from that in terms of our perspective of what's a good society? And that's the kind of the thought experiment that even if people come up with different answers than I have, like that I would like to encourage people to engage in in reading the book. If I understand you correctly, I think I agree with with almost everything you said, which is basically that there are certain things that we understand based on our genetic lottery that are uh, things about us that are true. There are things that can have implications based on our environment and our social network and our family, et cetera, that can be malleable. Um, but none of that means anything if we're inhabiting a world where you have no um, space to see that or mm -hmm. expound on that or to grow that or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or whatever. In my mind, equality always has to deal with um, opportunity and accessibility, which is many of the things that you pointed out. It's like, yeah, you can say all of these things, but if the person doesn't have, they can have the, uh, accessibility for something like, yeah, here you go. But if they don't have the opportunities to get that, it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. It means less really for somebody. And so understanding humans, understanding our genetics, understanding our environment can be helpful to then say, how do we construct a world in which everyone has mm -hmm. not just the same starting point, but that they have, um, people are going to finish the race differently based on many different things, but that yeah. we don't want a uh, environment where, you know, if we'll just take the race analogy, if you, you know, think of a racetrack, you know, one lane is, you know, got, you know, holes and rocks on it. And the other one's super clean. It's like, you know, we want to create a, 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 a kind of a world or a system where it, it's pretty much unilateral. And then what people do based on their, existing genetics and then their environment and their family and their social interactions 
then that is allowed to play out how it plays out. But it should yeah. not be that there are things in the world that are obfuscating one's ability to be able to do those things. Am I kind of getting what you're saying, right? Yeah, I mean, I th yes. So I think there shouldn't be things that like obf obfuscate, you know, right? Like we don't want, we don't want races where, you know, some people are running on, you know, different kinds of tracks than mm -hmm. other people. But I think it's more than just that, which is that we don't want just one race. I think one difficulty with the way that American society is structured is that we've penned too much on the the competitions inherent in getting through formal education like the types of skills that get you into college or get you into graduate school mm -hmm. and then i also think there are some things that aren't for uh, got up for grabs in a race format right like you know and again to put this in concrete terms like regardless of how you fare in any professional competition like, I still think you should be able to go to the doctor when you're sick, right? Yeah. And so that's an example of like, you know, not just like, I think so many of our gene environment debates are around like, well, there's this kind of like meritocratic competition in the United States and like how much of people's outcomes in that are due to their genetics versus to differences in their environment. And I think that question is important insofar as we're trying to identify inequalities in people's environmental opportunities. But it's not the only question. The other question is, you know, is can there be a multiplicity of competitions, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And are there things we owe each other regardless of the outcome of competition? And mm -hmm. those are the additional kind of topics that I want to uh, draw attention to. Yeah, yeah. I'm remembering at the towards the end of the book or last yeah. chapter or second last chapter, you mentioned this that I, I really, really agree with is that it, it, societies uh, don't need to be fixed, or excuse me, that, that uh, societies need to be fixed and, and people do not necessarily. It's one of those things where we say, it, it's not just about this one race. There are certain things that are outside of that. You know, people are, yeah. are more than their abilities or lack thereof. And how do we still have a, a world or a space where we can still respect that and, yeah. and honor that in terms of human dignity? So, and I, and I, and I think, one of the things in which you do in your book is to say, well, how can we first understand people? How can we understand their environments? And then how can we yeah. use that information to then understand um, yeah. many of the races that we're trying to run? So, yeah. yes. um, <laughs> Paige, you, you are, you are a, a tour de force. You have, <laughs> you, have a, you have a lot of energy. You have a lot of passion. I, I really, really admire and respect that and your work and your a lovely human being, which I, I'm so grateful that you have given me so much of your time and your energy. So where can people find you? Where can they get the book? Where can they find your research? All the, all the right places. So um, I have a website, which is my initials and last name, kpharden.com. And that has a sample of academic articles, but also articles written for a lay audience and some reviews of my book and some talks that I've given. I'm on Twitter at KPH3K and um, my book is now out and is available in hardback and audio and ebook Kindle form. So pick your medium that you like to read, listen to books. Um, and I'm also very easily Googleable. If you put in Paige Harden, Texas, uh, you will find me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I can't recommend her book more highly. Uh, Paige, this was lovely. Thank you so much. It was a great and, um, conversation. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. And uh, everyone, go get her book. Thank you.